Hi, and welcome to another episode of Rob's Traff on Tips for Beginners. I've been spending a couple weeks now uh, learning about something called the Randall Cycle, and I think it really ties in nicely with my video about calories and how you may struggle to lose weight and keep it off just counting on calories and why calories are kind of a goofy approximation of what's going on in your body and your hormones are more important to focus on. So go check out that video if you haven't already. Anyway, I'm going to be sharing some, some pictures and running through some notes I have here of what I've learned and try and break it down in a simple enough way. There are a lot of videos out there of people way more expert on this subject than I am. I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice. It is edutainment. So let's uh, dive in here. So the Randall cycle was invented by this fellow here, Sir Philip Randall in 1963. He was a professor of biochemistry and also a medical doctor. And his experiments were on muscle cells. And the Randall cycle explains how there's a competition in the body between glucose and fatty acids for being oxidized to create energy. It's a competitive feedback cycle, basically. And the experiments also tested a variety of hormones to see how they influence the muscle cells as well, from what I understand. Uh, there are two diagrams that make up the Randall cycle. And I'll pull up the first one now. This diagram represents uh, what's going to happen uh, if at a moment in time, Glucose is the primary energy source for a muscle cell. That's what this diagram represents. This diagram represents the opposite. It represents a moment in time when fatty acids are the primary energy source being used by a muscle cell to, for energy to do work. Uh, so the blue section here up at the top of the, this picture is um, the extracellular fluids outside of the muscle cell membranes and the middle section, kind of orangey, peachy, whatever you want to call it. That's the muscle cell fluid, the cytoplasm, and the green area is the where the mitochondria are, where you generate ATP, the, the energy powerhouse, basically. And both of these diagrams, this one and this one, are occurring simultaneously in the body. It's not one or the other. Uh, and these diagrams are updated versions of what was proposed in 1963. For example, there's a protein here called GLUT4, where my cursor is. Uh, that wasn't discovered until 1988. Uh, if you watch a video about the Randall cycle, it's important to understand that there's two diagrams. And if you're watching a video and somebody is only showing you one of them, they're being dishonest. They probably have an agenda or that, or they're being negligent. <laughs> they probably have an agenda they're trying to push to say like, you know what, eating too much of this one thing or another thing is what causes type two diabetes. And that's not right. There are two diagrams that you have to consider to make sense of the big picture. So before I go in any further into the Randall cycle, there's something I think is important to um, touch on. And that's this diagram here. Who knows how accurate this is? It's just something I grabbed for illustration purposes. Um, and what I wanna clear up with this diagram is that you get glucose not just from the carbohydrates that you eat, you get it from something called gluconeogenesis. Your liver will make glucose from the fat and the protein that you eat. So it's not just the carbs that you're eating that, that cause glucose. And if you, eat, if you don't eat any carbs, you will still get the glucose that you need for your brain, for example. That's why uh, people can eat a diet as extreme as the carnivore diet and still be okay. And I'll go into that a little further later on uh, when I talk about type one and type two diabetes actually. So this diagram shows you 
that uh, if you eat carbs, you'll have a, a much shorter spike of glucose in your blood, which will cause you to store fat. Because when your insulin goes up, you're in an energy storage mode, which is storing glucose and storing fat. And when you eat protein, it's going to take lo much longer to digest in about 40%. I don't know if that's accurate. It'll be converted to glucose. And about 10% of fats will get converted to glucose, according to this picture anyway. <laughs> and that may take uh, up to nine hours. So you can see there's a big difference between macro groups. So to say like a calorie is a calorie, like I said in my other video, is nonsense. But let's dive into the first uh, diagram, the first part of the Randall cycle in uh, greater detail. So this protein here called, uh, right here where my cursor is, called GLUT4, uh, brings glucose into the cell with the help of insulin pushing it in that door. It's called the GLUT4 door. Uh, and there's a series of reactions, and I'm not going to go into naming all these things. <laughs> and you can see here on the left, glycogen is produced. And also at the bottom, pyruvate is produced by what's going on in the middle here. And pyruvate gets into the mitochondria, and it continu contributes to what's called the Krebs cycle here in the middle and the creation of acetyl coenzyme A. It produces hydrogen for reaction with oxygen in the mitochondria to create water, release energy, and that energy is used to make ATP, basically. And you get CO2 and citrate as byproducts as well. Um, and with a buildup of citrate in the mitochondria, the citrate will eventually leak up into the cytoplasm, uh, the muscle cell fluid. And once there's a significant amount of buildup of citrate in this middle section here of the diagram, you will get what's called, what's like a deactivation of a process. So you see, it's not a normal arrow here. It's like a, uh, it's like a nail, that, that sort of flat head. That means a process deactivation. And so with enough citrate, um, that'll stop glucose from getting into the, the cell. And then what your body does is convert the, the remaining glucose, sort of clear it out. It converts what's left to glycogen. And then at the bottom here in the green section, it'll do, it'll get rid of the pyruvate that's left and it'll do what's called here anaplerosis gluconeogenesis. So it'll, it'll turn it into glucose and get it out of that cell and it'll get used in another cell. Uh, so with GLUT4 not working to get glucose into your cells, your blood sugar, your blood glucose will go up. And that's basically a demonstration here of what insulin resistance is, at least in that moment of, of time, this cell has shut the door to glucose and is resistant to insulin. It's your cells basically saying, I don't want any more glucose right now. And if there was more glucose inside the cell right now, that cell would start to get damaged. Excess glucose in the cell breaks down protein structures and causes DNA damage. Uh, and type two diabetes, which is elevated blood sugar, is your body's attempt to protect your cells from damage. Uh, you might also notice in the diagram that once the cell has enough energy uh, from glucose, that um, acetyl coenzyme A production is stopped by stopping the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A. There's another deactivation here where my cursor is. And yeah. So this GLUT4 door isn't locked permanently, obviously, or you would just shut down and you'd die, probably. It gets unlocked again when your body has done what it can to get rid of the glucose and the cell has kind of settled down and is not going to get damaged again. It's recovered. And your body converts also excess glucose to fat 
in the liver to triglycerides, which can get stored in your fat cells. And there's another mechanism that GLUT4 gets locked, and that's via fat consumption, and that's in the second diagram. And we'll go over that in a minute. Theoretically, the more that you lock this GLUT4 door, over time, the more your body thinks it needs to produce more insulin over time, and the more insulin resistant your cells become. As an aside, uh, exercise makes your body release glucose from the glycogen stores that you have, and GLUT4 takes that glucose into use for ATP. Glucose that is not oxidized gets rerouted to glycogen which kind of explains the rapid resynthesis of muscle glycogen post-exercise. So that's just a neat little tidbit. Another tidbit that's cool that I learned is uh, this Randall cycle diagram with glucose being used as the primary energy source at that point in time, it explains that it stays active for two to four days uh, when you consume carbs. And that's about the same amount of time it takes people to get back into ketosis when they're out of it. So it's because of the Randall cycle. It's very interesting. So anyway, let's dive into the second diagram of the Randall cycle, um, where it explains what happens when Fatty acids, is LCFA, long chain fatty acids, are being used as the primary energy source in a muscle cell at a point in time. And this is apparently the diagram that people like vegan doctors like to harp on saying, this is proof that fat causes all your problems, which is nonsense. <laughs> and then they don't show you the other diagram that shows how you can get problems by eating too much glucose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, eating fat produces triglycerides. You can see that right here, right? They aren't inherently a bad thing. You also get triglycerides from eating too many carbs, as I've mentioned before in videos. Triglycerides are a form of energy storage, just like glycogen. Not like, <laughs> and after you've generated enough citrate from eating a lot of fat, similar to the other diagram, uh, you will lock the door to oxidizing fatty acids for energy. Just how you can lock the door to glucose being brought in. Right? You can see here citrate, acetyl coenzyme A in the cytoplasm, melanil coenzyme A. And then it locks a different door. It's not up at the top of the diagram. So, which is in really interesting, not something to skip over. You see in this diagram here, that glucose gets locked out, period, because it will damage the cell, as I mentioned. And if you eat, if you your cell has gotten enough energy from fat, it doesn't lock CD36 here at the interface between the blue and sort of peachy section of this diagram. It locks the barrier between the cytoplasm and the mitochondria and, and fat, is allowed to come in the cell and just freely go in and out of the cell because it's not going to hurt the cell. So that's something very interesting that I learned looking into this. But yeah. Let's see here. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, this diagram explains what happens when you fast too. So the breakdown of triglycerides begins with the activation of something called hormone sensitive lipase. Again, hormones involved, surprise, surprise, in body composition control, like I talked about in my cal calorie video. And this enzyme is stimulated by glucagon, which is a hormone, epinephrine, AKA adrenaline, hormone, cortisol, hormone, human growth hormone, hormone, all of which increase plasma have increased plasma levels during fasting. And each of these hormones activates hormone sensitive lipase through 
different pathways. And when you fast, your insulin drops, which allows your glucagon to go up. And then the free fatty acids increase in the blue area, which allows your muscle cells to use fatty acids when you're fasting to for energy. So you have this sort of slow trickle of energy into your mitochondria from your stored fat when you're fasting. That's how it works. Pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to pull up a, a different diagram for a minute here. Find it. This one about glucagon. It illustrates what I was talking about just a minute ago. Um, like you can see here, this line is glucose. If you eat some something that's got carbohydrates, some glucose in it, you're going to have a spike. You're going to have a response in insulin that comes up and goes down once the glucose is under control. And you can see an inverse reaction here. Um, the red line, your glucagon, as your insulin goes up, your, your glucagon tails off and vice versa. So there's this interrelation of those two hormones, just like I said. And when your insulin is high, you're storing energy. When your glucagon is high, you can access that stored fat. I mean, besides the other things that that allow you to access that stored fat. In summary, looking at these two diagrams and what we've gone over, I'll just pull this diagram up. Looking at these two diagrams and what we've gone over, eating too much carbohydrate will lock up your muscle cell from taking in both glucose and fat for energy. How does that happen? I mean, if the citrate level goes up high enough, you can see from both diagrams that you're going to lock both out and vice versa. Eating too much fat, you're going to lock both fat and glucose out of your cells. <laughs> so that would imply some kind of basic rule about fat loss. Don't eat high amounts of fats together with a lot of carbs. What, how do most people eat? They eat a diet that is high in both carbs and fat, activating both sides of the Randall cycle. That's basically guaranteeing that over time you're going to get obese. <laughs> Not necessarily obese, but gain weight. You're just you're going to struggle with your weight if you activate both sides of the Randall cycle. You're going to lock out fat, which is then going to get stored as fat tissue. And you're going to lock out glucose, which is going to get stored as fat tissue. And to make things even worse, I mean, a lot of people snack in between meals on things high in carbs, stimulating insulin, suppressing glucagon, making it even harder to lose body fat. And the only time their glucagon is low during the day is when they're sleeping. Uh, I got insulin resistance eating a high fat and high carb diet. And that didn't matter after a while that I exercised a lot as an amateur triathlete and I did some intermittent fasting that all that did was delay the inevitable, uh, that you can't outrun or outfast a bad, a bad diet. It's going to catch up to you. Now, uh, I also wanted to pull up some information here about some foods um, and point out that there aren't really foods in nature that are both high in fat, equally high in fat and equally high in carbs. I don't think it, I don't think that's a thing. Like for example, let's look at nutritional information on avocados, right? 29 grams of fat in a whole avocado, 17 grams of carbs and four grams of protein. So there's, there's, you know, not quite double, but the ratio is not equal. This is more fat. What else is high in fat? For example, nuts, nuts and seeds. So there's this chart here and you can look at, okay, almonds, 14 grams of 
of fat, six grams of protein, uh, six grams of carbs. So way more fat than carbs. And all these numbers are different. Pecans, 20 grams of, 0.4 grams of fat, 2.6 grams of protein per 28 gram portion is what it says. And then 3.9 grams of carbs, totally different ratio, but it's nowhere near equal. Now let's look at coconut also. There's lots of saturated fat in coconut. So like, what is this here? Looking at these portions, um, you can see the ratios here. 15 grams of carbs, three grams of protein, and more than double fat. So there's, there really isn't anything in nature that's, that's like high in fat and high in carbs, but the food that we make that's highly processed is really good at being both those things. <laughs> I mean, look at a vegetable. There's no fat in vegetables or fruit. Some of the fiber in them will get converted to long chain fatty acids, but uh, there's no fat in them when you consume them. And you look at meat and fish and eggs, they're protein and, and they're fat. There's no, you know, there's no crazy amount of carbs in there along with the fat. So that's something interesting to think about in terms of our food supply and what you find in nature versus all this processed crap that everybody eats so much of nowadays. The, the next topic I wanted to touch on is diabetes. I'll just pull up this picture here and you can look at that while I ramble. <laughs> One of the conclusions that Sir Philip Randall made in his research, which has since been, since been proven to be false, was that high levels of fat consumption cause abnormal glucose, i.e. carbohydrate metabolism. I mean, the correct interpretation is that it's associated with abnormal glucose metabolism. Um, why would he make that conclusion? Uh, well, he wasn't working with a full picture at the time. He didn't know about glucagon. He didn't know about the GLUT4 receptor or the concept of insulin resistance either back then. There was also no distinction between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes at the time. He was concerned primarily with, with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetics can't make enough insulin. And when your insulin is low, your glucagon is high. In other words, when your glucagon is high, your glucose metabolism will be impaired. It's not the fault of your fat that you're a type 1 diabetic. Your body is trying to fuel your muscles with whatever in whatever way it can, and it's, and it's going to adapt you know, without insulin injections. Even when a type one diabetic is eating food, their insulin will be low and their glucagon will be high. Unchecked, their blood glucose will keep going up until their body puts them into a coma to protect them from ingesting more glucose. So it's wrong to blame fat for their impaired carbohydrate metabolism. Now, what about type two diabetes? With type two diabetes, your cells are insulin resistant enough that you have high blood sugar throughout the day. If you eat a typical diet without taking insulin injections to force the glucose into your cells, without a sufficiently high insulin level, your body will oxidize fat for energy. So again, it doesn't mean that it's fat's fault that you're insulin resistant. In fact, the diet that's most successful of putting type 2 diabetes into remission is a low carb diet. <laughs> because you lower your blood glucose, therefore lowering insulin production, therefore improving insulin sensitivity of GLUT4. Now, some people do have success reversing insulin resistance losing weight, 
by going on a very low fat diet. It can be done. This would primarily activate only one side of the Randall cycle. Uh, although, like I mentioned before, some fiber is broken down into fatty acids. Uh, and in that case, fatty acids would not be contributing much to citrate buildup that would lock the GLUT4 door as much. So to say, I don't, I don't think that it's right to say it's just fat that causes type 2 diabetes or it's just carbohydrates that cause it. But we know from getting an understanding of the Randall cycle that you want to guarantee that you get insulin resistance and you gain weight, eat high carb and high fat and do that for over years and you will get insulin resistant and you will get overweight. <laughs> um, just briefly want to mention that eating a very low fat vegan diet has the potential to mess up your hormones and make you deficient in numerous nutrients. And that's not to say you can't do it. I'm not saying that. Okay, don't get upset. If you're determined to do it, you can't just willy nilly do it is what I'm trying to say briefly here. Um, you need to be very scientific about it, about your diet and supplementation to get it right, or you'll have health implications. Well, that's a topic for a totally different video. So now I'm going to switch to a picture of the brain to just briefly touch on something else um, that I learned that about people who go super low carb. You can see here the brain needs glucose, but it can also use ketones for energy. Sorry if it's a little fuzzy. It's the biggest picture I could find. Um, so what do I mean by low carb, like going, having 10% or less, like super low carb, 10% or less of your food intake coming from carbs, for example, the carnivore diet, right? Uh, it could backfire on you and induce insulin resistance. But you have to consider a few things and adjust your perspective about that. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Uh, your brain, for example, can use ketones and lactate for energy in a ketogenic state, but it still needs glucose. That's why I'm showing this, this picture. Uh, so in this case, your body being the amazing thing that it, that it is, it'll adapt by making your muscles insulin resistant to ensure that your brain gets the glucose that it needs. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so the brain's sensitivity to insulin will be preserved and your muscles have an incredible capacity to use fat and ketones for energy on a diet that's low in carbohydrates. So they'll carry on working just fine and your brain will too. So in, in summary, insulin resistance caused by a really low carbohydrate diet or even fasting is basically, it's an adaptation maybe temporary, maybe long-term to preserve glucose for your brain. And I guess uh, some other vital organs to, to block the uptake of glucose by muscles. So it doesn't steal glucose from other things that need it. So that that's pretty awesome. I think. Let's go back to this diagram here. Diabetes type two diabetes, believe it or not, you haven't heard can be reversed whatever your doctor tells you it can be reversed in a lot of people curing it starts with foods with eliminating food that causes problems with glucose metabolism and processed food is a huge culprit it combines fats and carbs together and and as you know now from the randall cycle that's a perfect recipe high fat high carb is a perfect recipe you to get insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes over time. Those foods are designed to be addictive and easy to overeat, which will lock your GLUT4 and lock out fatty acids from the mitochondria. The, that first step of removing those processed foods from your diet will keep your insulin resistance from getting worse. 
pretty much. And from there, I guess you could decide doing your own research. Do you want to go try going low carb or low fat to try and fix your insulin resistance? Uh, insulin sensitivity and people like that, that are insulin resistant can also be improved by exercising and fasting. Uh, and if you can't stick to a low carb or low fat diet, then you should at least try not to combine high carb foods and high fat foods in your diet all the time. So eat things like rice, bread, potatoes, fruit, etc., with a low fat protein and some fiber for satiety might be a strategy. Or you could eat things like bacon, eggs, steak, nuts, butter, without a bunch of carbs. Then you get the fat and the protein helping you feel full. And so you don't need to overeat. So there's two, two ideas if you can't stick to a strict diet. Uh, lastly, in terms of type 2 diabetes, I wanted to talk about something really cool that I learned uh, about just this week. Like I said in my one of my videos, I think about calories. Um, you know, it takes considerable knowledge to realize your own ignorance on a topic. And I learned something weekly, guaranteed. Uh, so I learned about a study in 2012 by Harvard, published in the Journal of Nature. And they studied mice and they showed that exercising muscles produce a hormone called irisin which is also something in human beings and irisin travels through the body in the blood and alters fat cells and uh, most of the fat cells in the human body are what's called white fat cells and their function is to store fat let me pull up a different picture here brown versus white fat so the Spoiler alert, <laughs> there's another type of fat if you didn't know. Brown fat cells uh, are chock full of energy burning mitochondria, these sort of red blobs, red ovals. <laughs> <laughs> and the main function of brown fat is to generate body heat by burning fat. So if your goal is to lose weight, you want to increase the number of brown fat cells and decrease your white fat cells. And what irisin does, at least in mice from this one study, is help convert the white fat cells into brown fat cells. And this newly created brown fat cells just keep burning energy even after you're done exercising. But it gets better. We've known for some time that a regular program of moderate exercise protects us against type 2 diabetes. Now, how does that happen? Irisin may be a, an important part of the answer. In addition to its effects in creating brown fat cells, it also helps prevent and overcome insulin resistance, which leads to type 2 diabetes. So there's another example of what I was saying in my other video about why focusing on calories is a mistake because you need to learn about the hormones in your body. And here's another example of a hormone that I didn't know about that plays a, a apparently very important role and explains one of the benefits of exercising. <laughs> Thing that I'm left wondering after learning what I've learned so far about the Randall cycle is, is about citrate here. Um, and I did some brief searching, but I wasn't able to find an answer about whether there's a difference between citrate produced from long chain fatty acids being oxidized or glucose being oxidized. And by what I mean by that is the rate at which citrate is produced. Does one form of fuel make citrate faster than the other. I think that would be interesting to know. Maybe there would be some implications in terms of, you know, one type of food making you get insulin resistance faster. Yeah, I mean, if you could find that study, 
and drop it in the comments below because I'd love to read that. I think that would be really interesting to know. And uh, if you're a researcher and you're watching my video and maybe you can look at, maybe you can do a study. That'd be cool. So all things considered with the Randall cycle, it makes me wonder if everybody knew about this in enough detail that people would fall into probably three groups. Um, they'd adopt a low carb, high fat diet all the time, or they would adopt a low fat, high carb diet all the time, or maybe they'd alternate from one of those diets to the other every month or every three months or every six months or something like that, like a kind of hybrid approach to trying to manage the implications of the Randall cycle and make sure that they don't become insulin resistant, that they get a variety of nutrients, that they aren't bored with food, for example. Um, so I'll end this discussion with a finding from the study that should really kind of blow your mind, which I haven't mentioned yet, and make you think twice about what you've been told as an athlete about what you need to eat. Uh, Sir Philip Randall found that muscle cells seem to prefer metabolizing fatty acids for energy. <laughs> you heard that right. Muscle cells seem to prefer fat for energy. Like, wait a minute. Isn't that the opposite of what you've heard? That your muscles need glucose. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and make sure to subscribe to my channel and share it with people who may benefit from it. Thanks.